This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. A commercial-free version of this podcast is available on Patreon for $1 per month. Patreon.com forward slash Beyond Contempt Podcast. I'm Renee, and this is Beyond Contempt True Crime. You're listening to episode 39, Samuel Scheinbein. Stepan is a small village made up of 4,000 residents in western Ukraine. During World War II, Nazi German forces occupied Stepan, and over 3,000 Jewish citizens were killed, including some members of the Scheinbein family. Saul Scheinbein's parents were fortunate and had immigrated to the British ruled section of Palestine before the war. Saul was born in Palestine in 1944, but by the time he was six, his family moved to the United States. He attended the City College of New York and earned a law degree from George Washington University. Saul was a successful lawyer. He was a patent examiner for the United States government and was a senior patent attorney for both NASA and the Navy. Even though Saul lived in the United States, he kept his Israeli passport. He married a woman named Victoria, and they started a family. They had three kids, Robert, Natalie, and Samuel. Sam was the youngest and was born on July 25, 1980. Religion was important to the Scheinbein family, and all their kids were raised in the Jewish faith. The family lived in a small city in Montgomery County, Maryland, called Aspen Hill, which had a good school system. Samuel attended a large public high school where he performed well in academics. His six foot one inch frame was well suited for athletics, and he was on the school's wrestling team. Samuel was a young man poised for success up until his senior year of high school when he decided to turn down a different path. Samuel Scheinbein had a crush on a girl and offered a friend a grand to lure her boyfriend into a car. He was willing to pay $5,000 to have the boyfriend murdered. When this friend declined to participate in that insanity, Scheinbein tried to play the conversations off as a joke. He then decided it would be ideal to practice murdering someone first. Samuel Scheinbein's friend, Aaron Needle, had a similar problem. Needle had a crush on his classmate, Hannah Choi. Hannah's friend, Freddie Tello, got into a fight with Aaron Needle. Tello punched out Needle in front of Hannah, which caused him embarrassment. Needle told Samuel Scheinbein about the incident, and suddenly, the pair found a perfect practice murder victim in Freddie Tello. On September 15, 1997, as Freddie Tello was moving out of his mom's house into his own apartment, Needle and Scheinbein were in perpetual communication, plotting Freddie's demise. During their 22 calls to each other that day, Needle and Scheinbein must have been discussing all the items they needed to pull off the murder, because that day, and the next, several items were procured. Two pairs of goggles were purchased from Toys R Us. $264.83 was spent at the Home Depot for a trash can, several propane cylinders, a torch kit, and a circular saw. Later on, a shopping list with all these items was found in Scheinbein's car and would be called a recipe for murder by the lawyers who prosecuted the case. His list included zap, pepper, metal restraints, rain suits, a hobby knife, plastic bags, and size 14 shoes. Needle and Scheinbein both wore size 10 shoes, but the O.J. Simpson trial was on top of minds that year. If they don't fit, you must acquit, was written on that list. Meaning, if the shoes don't fit, this plan could get them acquitted if they were caught. At 6 p.m. on September 16, 1997, Freddy Tello finished work and was picked up by Needle and Scheinbein. Law enforcement believed they used a stun gun to subdue Freddy, then choked, stabbed, and beat him to death. The autopsy report 
concluded that Freddie Tello died from blunt force injuries to the head, ligature strangulation, and cuts that were sustained on the neck and the chest. Freddie's body was temporarily stored in Samuel Scheinbein's garage, where the two boys dismembered the victim. They attempted to burn the body to obscure Freddie Tello's identity. On September 17th, the Scheinbein family noticed a horrible smell in their garage. Samuel made up an excuse and claimed that a battery from a moped had exploded. He needed to get the body out of his parents' garage and called up one of his classmates, Kevin Kellner Jr. Scheinbein said he needed a private place to take a girl he was interested in. Kevin offered a vacant home that his parents owned and told him where the spare keys were kept. On September 18th, Needle and Scheinbein placed Freddie's body in trash bags, loaded up Needle's car, and drove over to the empty house. A neighbor reported seeing two boys digging in the yard. On September 19, 1997, two realtors went over to the Kellner's vacant home to get it ready for a showing. There was a pungent smell coming from the garage, and when they investigated, they found a black garbage bag with what looked like blood running off onto the garage floor. The Montgomery County Police were called, and when they investigated, they believed that a deer carcass was in the plastic bag because of all the charring and mutilation. Eventually, they figured out that the remains were human, but couldn't determine the victim's identity and began a homicide investigation. In the garage, police found rubber gloves, a blood-stained shirt, a police scanner, propane cylinders, and a Home Depot bag with a receipt showing the power saw and the cylinders had been bought several days earlier. Police started interviewing neighbors. When Kevin Kellner's mom asked him who might have been in the home, he told her that Samuel Scheinbein wanted to use the house to have some privacy with a girlfriend. The police went to the Scheinbein residence and questioned Saul and Victoria. Their son Samuel had not come home from school, and he often hung out with another boy named Aaron Needle. Law enforcement went to the Needle's residence and learned that he had not come home from school either. Police issued warrants for both Samuel Scheinbein and Aaron Needle. Tracking dogs discovered a blood trail from the location of the body all the way to the Scheinbein's garage. There was evidence of a fire inside the garage, along with an empty box for a power saw. The matching power saw was located by the dismembered body in the vacant garage. Apparently, Scheinbein and Needle fled to New York City. They both phoned their parents to let them know where they were. Aaron Needle's mom wired her son some money and told him to take the train back to Maryland. On September 22, 1997, Freddie Tello's mom called the police to report her son missing. When law enforcement investigated this report, they discovered Freddie told his friends that he was going to meet them at the mall. He was also going to bring Aaron Needle and Samuel Scheinbein. But Freddie never showed up. Freddie Tello's dental records were used to verify that he was indeed the mutilated victim found in the vacant garage. His arms and legs were never recovered. They arrested Aaron Needle on September 23rd. His mom was driving him to see a lawyer, and they found him hiding under a blanket in the car. The Scheinbeins had a much different response than the Needle family. Samuel's father, Saul, and his older brother, Robert, met Sam in New York. They brought him some new clothes along with his passport. They then drove him to JFK and put him on a flight to Tel Aviv, Israel. After Samuel landed in Israel, his brother Robert flew out to meet him. The brothers allegedly partied in a hotel room. Robert provided his little brother with his first bottle of wine and a paid sexual encounter from a sex worker. Samuel nearly overdosed on September 25, 1997 from washing down sleeping pills with wine. The police were involved in the incident and found a suicide letter in his hotel room that was addressed to his family. In the letter, he apologized to everyone for all the hardships he put them through. He hoped everything would be okay after he was gone and wanted everyone to move on with their lives. 
they sent Samuel to a psychiatric hospital. He was subsequently arrested, and they informed the United States that he was in Israel. Samuel's parents flew to Israel to be with him, and their visit turned into a permanent stay. Since his father still kept his passport from Israel, Samuel claimed Israeli citizenship to avoid extradition to the United States. This set off a complicated tug of war between the United States, Israel, and the Israeli court system. Samuel Scheinbein only had been to Israel once on vacation, when he was a young boy, so his claim to citizenship was flimsy. The U.S. Department of Justice requested that Samuel Scheinbein be extradited back to the United States. The Israeli Attorney General began the extradition proceedings, but the Scheinbein family hired a former Israeli justice minister to defend their son, which kicked off a legal battle that would strain relations between the two countries. Prominent officials like Attorney General Janet Reno and U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright even inserted themselves into this negotiation. The U.S. Congress tried temporarily withholding $76 million of aid from Israel to speed up the extradition process. The Jerusalem District Court hosted the Scheinbein extradition hearings. In February 1998, the judge came up with a compromise where Samuel Scheinbein would return to the United States for his trial, and if he were convicted, he would serve a sentence in Israel. The Scheinbein family agreed to this, but the state of Maryland did not. In September 1998, the judge then ruled that Samuel Scheinbein could be extradited back to the United States since he didn't have an actual connection to Israel. He never lived there previously and therefore wasn't protected under their legal system. This decision was appealed and went to the Israeli Supreme Court. There was a 3-2 to two vote to block his extradition back to the United States. The rationale was based on a 1978 law, which banned the extradition of Israeli citizens, and Samuel Scheinbein's lack of ties to Israel did not affect his claim to Israeli citizenship. Dissenting judges worried that this ruling had the power to turn Israel into a magnet for fleeing criminals. The Attorney General made one last effort to extradite Scheinbein and requested a larger panel of Supreme Court judges review this case. The request was denied, and Samuel Scheinbein was allowed to remain in Israel. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. Thank you to Best Fiends for sponsoring this episode of Beyond Contempt True Crime. Podcast listeners, let me tell you about Best Fiends. It's an engaging puzzle game that everyone is playing. It's a casual game that you play on your phone. I've even played it on my iPad before. Well, mostly because the eyesight ain't what it used to be. But Best Fiends keeps adding new levels and events every single month, so they keep it entertaining. It's a great game to play when I need to take a break from writing podcast scripts. And you don't need to be tethered to Wi-Fi because you can play without an internet connection. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must play. Download Best Fiends, free in the Apple App Store or on Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Hi everyone, I really need to tell you about BetterHelp Online Counseling. It's an affordable service where you can connect with one of their licensed professional therapists. You can find counselors that specialize in just about anything, including anxiety, depression, family conflicts, trauma, and LGBTQ issues. I work from home and barely leave my house, so it's great that you can communicate with your counselor from the privacy of your own home. BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional in-person counseling, and financial aid is available. So many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states, and you can start talking with your counselor in less than 24 hours. I want you to start living a happier life today. 
As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash beyondcontempt. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp.com slash beyondcontempt. Now, back to the show. On March 22, 1999, they charged Samuel Scheinbein with intent to kill in the Tel Aviv District Court, which was the United States equivalent of first-degree murder. He entered a plea of innocence. After all, he told his father and his lawyer that Aaron Needle was the one who actually killed Freddie Tello, and he only took part in dismembering the body. Scheinbein claimed it was self-defense, as Tello was trying to rob them. The saga of Samuel Scheinbein had already dragged on for a year and a half since the murder of Freddie Tello. The prosecution pursued a plea deal to avoid wasting any more time and money on this case. In August 1999, Samuel Scheinbein accepted a plea agreement and pleaded guilty. He accepted 10 charges related to the murder of Freddie Tello, and he confessed to choking Freddie and beating him with an object. Scheinbein's mother, Victoria, had a tough time at the sentencing. She told the press that this was not fair. Her son was not a monster, and this couldn't have happened to a better kid. Samuel had little reaction when a panel of judges sentenced him to 24 years in prison. He was eligible for furloughs after four years behind bars and could be paroled after 16 years. For Israel, it was one of the harsher sentences handed out to a person convicted of committing murder as a juvenile. The outcome was not satisfying for officials in both the United States and Israel. Judges, prosecution, and even the defense felt that the Scheinbeins had exploited extradition law, which was really meant to protect Jewish folks from being shipped to anti-Semitic nations. The state attorney for Montgomery County in Maryland felt his 24-year sentence with furloughs was too light. Maryland kept Scheinbein's arrest warrant active in the United States, and also with Interpol. If he set foot in any of the over 190 Interpol member countries, including the United States, he would be extradited, arrested, and prosecuted, even if he served all his prison time in Israel. Double jeopardy laws would not apply to him since he was convicted overseas. As Samuel awaited trial, they housed him in a juvenile detention center. Once he arrived at his 18th birthday, they sent him to a maximum security prison. Later on, he was transferred to a state-of-the-art maximum security prison that had a large staff, 700 surveillance cameras, and could house over 1,000 prisoners. The facility had 13 wings, and each wing had a kitchenette, dining room, canteen, laundry room, club room, and courtyard. They had a library, classrooms, and even a gym. It was more like being at a university than a prison. The cells were very dorm-like, with separate bathrooms and closets. Prisoners were called residents, and were allowed TVs, videos, and CDs in their cells. Scheinbein took advantage of the educational opportunities and finished a computer-related degree, and he also enjoyed working with Wood in their industrial study shop. Samuel was well-behaved and became eligible for furloughs, which were only granted to residents who passed psych exams and had good behavior. He went on 96 outings that ranged in length from 24 to 96 hours. Scheinbein would often spend time with his parents outside Tel Aviv. On December 13, 2012, they found a shiv in Scheinbein's room. At his hearing in March 2013, he claimed the shiv was not his and was planted there by another prisoner since the residents had access to each other's cells. Scheinbein wanted the weapon tested for DNA and wanted security footage reviewed. These requests were denied, but it was determined that they could not use this incident against him when he was up for parole. His furloughs were put on hold. Samuel Scheinbein eventually had his furloughs reinstated after he challenged the ruling in court. He took a furlough on February 6, 2014, and went to a city called Ramla to meet up with someone selling a gun. After the initial meeting, the two men headed to the ammunition store, when Scheinbein abruptly grabbed the gun and took off. The seller caught him and called the police. 
They arrested Samuel Scheinbein and sent him back to prison. He was locked down in his cell that weekend. The Israel Prison Service transferred him to another facility since he had a behavior problem. On February 23, 2014, Scheinbein phoned his attorney to thank her. He told her goodbye, and he put her on notice that she would be hearing about him shortly. The attorney immediately called the DA's office and wanted them to act quickly. She was convinced that Samuel was going to commit suicide. Thirty minutes later, guards were transferring Scheinbein to a different prison cell. He asked to stop at the bathroom, pulled out a handgun, and shot three guards. Scheinbein barricaded himself in the bathroom, and the prison staff now had a standoff on their hands. They called in a counterterrorism unit to help with the negotiations. An hour elapsed, and Scheinbein fired more shots, which wounded three more guards. They fired back, and he was seriously wounded. Samuel Scheinbein died shortly after, despite efforts to revive him. He must have found another gun and smuggled it into prison after having that failed attempt the year prior. The gun he used was traced to a central Israel resident who had previously reported the gun stolen. They found a prison guard uniform, keys to the prison doors, and a magazine from the handgun in Scheinbein's cell. Six guards and one prisoner were wounded in the standoff. Scheinbein was only a year away from parole eligibility. His lawyer blamed the Israel Prison Service for not listening to her warnings. She wanted them to put Samuel on suicide watch and get him psychiatric help. Saul and Victoria Scheinbein buried their son on February 25, 2014. The devoted parents moved to Israel to stay close to him right after his arrest. Saul and his son Robert had been arrested by the Israel police. They were charged with interfering with the investigation and had their passports confiscated. Their time in police custody was short-lived, and they were quickly released. The state of Maryland charged Saul Scheinbein with obstruction of justice less than a year after he sent his son abroad. Saul was wanted on an arrest warrant for hindering the police investigation. He could not be extradited at the time, because they only considered the crime a misdemeanor. The Scheinbeins sold their Aspen Hill home for $180,000 in April 1998. Victoria and Saul's presence back in Maryland was unnecessary, as the paperwork was notarized at the American Embassy in Tel Aviv. Saul was disbarred by the state of Maryland in 2002 and was disbarred by Washington, D.C. in 2004. In 2005, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office revoked his patent attorney license. Saul took a consultant job in patent law. He couldn't practice law, but he could still advise. Samuel's brother, Robert Scheinbein, moved to Chicago for a small time, but emigrated to Israel, where he laid down permanent roots. He married and had two children. Samuel's sister, Natalie, remained in the United States and graduated from the University of Maryland with a degree in criminal justice. She said when Samuel was kindergarten age, other parents thought he was off and he would never get invited to birthday parties. After the murders, Natalie told the press that her brother was a troubled kid who had obsessive-compulsive disorder and showed signs and symptoms of schizophrenia. When she was asked to comment on the murder, Natalie thought that the whole situation was tragic, but wanted to press forward with her life. She thought her father, Saul, was a solid man and did everything he could do to protect his family. Both Robert and Natalie changed their last name to Shine, S-H-E-I-N, to distance themselves from their infamous last name. In April 1998, Aaron Needle was sitting in jail, waiting for his criminal trial to begin. He would never be tried in court, as he hung himself with a bedsheet inside a cell, two days before jury selection was scheduled to begin. Aaron Needle's lawyer said, Prior to his suicide, Aaron had a long session with a psychiatrist. Aaron's parents ran their own business out of their North Bethesda home and had a good life. Samuel and Aaron were classmates at Charles E. Smith Jewish Day School and became friends. They often got into trouble 
And after that, they sent Aaron to schools that were more like boot camps for troubled students. Aaron didn't last and dropped out. His father didn't know how to handle him, and even had him committed for a psychological examination because of his substance abuse issues. He was also forced to call the police on his son when Aaron stole his car. Aaron got his life together enough to finish a GED certificate and even enrolled in Montgomery College. He was considering a career in the U.S. Marine Corps. Aaron Needle got to know Freddie Tello since Aaron had a fish tank and Freddie worked at an aquatic pet store. But their friendship soured when Freddie felt Aaron was mistreating a female friend and punched him out. This unwittingly put a target on Freddie's back. Aaron Needle's funeral was well attended. His mother was filled with worry about her son committing suicide because the Jewish religion disallowed it. Like the Scheinbein family, the Needle family held the religion in high regard. She was pleased that Aaron had reconnected with faith in prison and was eating only kosher foods. Plus, he left this earth on the last day of Passover, which was the same day the Jews were delivered from bondage. The Needles sold their home in 1999 and moved into a condo where they continued running their computer software business. They buried Aaron Needle next to his grandparents. His grave tablet reads, Beloved son and brother, along with a few lines of Hebrew, Your name shall be Israel, because you struggled with God and with men. And he did struggle. One consequence of the Scheinbein murder case was it played a role in Israel amending its extradition laws. In 1999, they proposed a law that required citizens to have residential connections to Israel to be immune to extradition laws. Two years later, in 2001, a law allowed the extradition of Israel citizens on the condition that a nation guaranteed the convicted served their prison sentence in Israel. In 2005, the U.S. and Israel signed an agreement that allowed for reciprocal extradition of people charged or convicted with an offense, as long as the potential sentence was one year or greater in length for both nations. These policies ensured that there would never be another case like Samuel Scheinbein. The residence where Freddie Tello's remains were discovered sold for $180,000 to a woman who was aware of what happened. Instead of focusing on the murder in the garage, she pretends that it took place elsewhere and it has nothing to do with the house itself. Alfredo Freddie Enrique Tello Jr. was 19 at the time of his death and worked at a tropical fish store. Freddie was a gifted art student. His art teacher thought he was talented enough to run his own studio. Over 200 people attended his funeral. Freddie did not have a burial since his body was so badly mutilated. He was cremated, and his ashes rest in an urn that sits on his mother's fireplace mantle. Even though his mother, Iliette, remarried after Freddie's death and tried to move on with her life, she nevertheless remained struggling for two decades after he was gone. Iliette still places one of her son's t-shirts under her pillow while she sleeps. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. Please visit beyondcontemptpodcast.com for the links to the sources and music used in this episode. Research, writing, editing, audio production, and music scoring were performed by me. Thank you to new patron Pam. I appreciate you supporting the show. For everyone else, if you like the show, please leave me a favorable review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much, everyone.